What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here, and back to review episode nine of season five of The Expanse, an episode called Winnipesaukee. If you hear the sounds of construction in the background, I apologize, but I have a construction site right outside my window, and they are just going berserk, but I hope this mic is just getting what I want. In any case, if you haven't seen the episode yet, this will be your first and only spoiler warning. Sadly, this season, it's almost over. And after next week, the absence of this show in my life is going to leave this giant hole in my weekly routine. But I'm going to focus on the positive and just enjoy the fact that this season has been such a gripping and exciting ride so far. But before I get to my official review, I have to give a shout out to the latest Expanse after show about episode 8, where Wes Chatham, Amos himself, had the unique opportunity to interview both halves of the writing duo that make up the powerhouse author and creator of the expanse james s.a corey i'd never seen ty frank and daniel abraham in a conversation before and i found their interactions to be fascinating in particular how they divide up their writing duties and how they'll take turns working on particular chapters and editing each other's stuff basically passing the material back and forth between them but if you're wondering how they cooked up this fictional setting they met at a sci-fi convention in albuquerque and originally they had the idea of turning this universe into a role-playing game so they play tested the setting a bit with their wives when abraham realized just how much of the heavy lifting had already been done by Ty Frank in creating this world, and he suggested that they start co-writing the books, an area where Daniel Abraham already had a lot of experience. And they claimed that by the time they were halfway through book two, Caliban's War, one of my favorite books in the series, they already knew how book nine was going to end. And speaking of which, book nine, Leviathan Falls, should be getting a release later this year, and I eagerly look forward to power reading the shit out of it. In any case, their conversation ended with this great joke about how this show is essentially this incredibly expensive commercial for their books. They sarcastically state, if you spend a few million dollars on a show, you can sell thousands of books. And all kidding aside, something tells me they've already sold considerably more than a few thousand books. But their point is clear. So for all of you diehard Expanse fans out there who have not yet read the books, as always, I recommend that you start with the very first one, Leviathan Wakes. The books have everything you love about the show, but just way more scope, detail, and just straight up epic scenes that the show could never afford. But let's get down to this latest episode, which was written by Ty Frank, Daniel Abraham, and series showrunner, Naren Shankar, and anytime you have James S.A. Corey himself handling the writing duties, that's always a good thing. But that's also probably why book nine is taking a little longer to get into our greedy hands. But when it comes to breaking down this episode as usual, I'm just going to tackle each of the major storylines separately just to keep things simple. So let's start with Ava Sarala. To put it mildly, she's horrified by the senseless attack on Palace Station, no matter how many of Marco's sympathizers might have been killed, because she understands that such an attack plays right into the narrative that Marco Inaris is always trying to sell, namely, that Earth is at war with the belt. She knows that Marco's an extremist who doesn't represent the belt on the whole, and that potentially there might be belter factions that could be enlisted to fight him, but that's not possible as long as Earth is attacking the belt's largest population centers. Because she knows for every belter partisan they might have killed on Palace, they created 10 more. And when she hears about a proposed attack on Siri Station, where millions live, she resigns in protest. But luckily for her cause, more resignations follow, so many that a zero confidence vote and pastor gets scheduled. And then Amasarala, she's asked not only to serve again, but to lead. And in her first act, she recruits her political adversary, Admiral Felix Delgado, to serve in her cabinet. One of the greatest qualities of Amasarala is that she's one of those rare politicians who recognizes the value of different points of view. And so the two of them bury the hatchet over a cocktail, as well as a joke. We didn't get to see a lot of Marco and Philip this episode, but we do see Marco receiving these battle reports about losses on both sides in the conflict. Carol reaches out to him and shares the fact that she suspects that Naomi could very well still be alive aboard the Chetsamoka. Marco's pissed beyond words and he orders Drummer to attack and destroy the Rosinante, which in turn raises Drummer's suspicions because the attack is totally unnecessary if the Rossi is already flying into a trap. The last we see of Marco is the scene where he tells Philip that his mother lives, but he frames the story in such a way to make it appear as if Naomi chose to leave her son yet again. The manipulative games never stop with Marco. We get a small taste of Naomi's friends and allies this episode, but not much. Holden, Monica, and Bull, they try and decipher Naomi's message, all while Alex and Bobby are doing the same. The Razorback, aka the renamed Screaming Firehawk, is a little bit closer to Naomi and continues to make a hard burn in her direction. And the episode ends with Naomi seeing on her screen that the Screaming Firehawk is in close proximity, which prompts her to go ahead and suit up one final time and head out into space. Some folks might be rightly wondering what the hell is she going to do with the suit that's already running out of air? But you have to keep in mind that the entire ship is running low on air as well, which is why she keeps track of every single trip outside, because every time she moves outside, the ship loses a decent chunk of its dwindling air supply. In any event, aboard Drummer Ship, tensions continue to run high. Oksana's loyal to Carol and Marco, but she still has a lot of love and affection for Drummer, 
drummer. The drummer finally just gets exasperated and lets Oksana have it and screams at her for keeping secrets from her. It was an incredibly satisfying emotional beat, and it's one of many reasons why Drummer has so many diehard fans. Oksana yields and shares the fact that Naomi is very much still alive and well, but she urges Drummer to stay loyal to Marcos so that he doesn't kill all of them. But the big, main, central, action-packed drama this episode was the showdown at Lake Winnipesaukee, where Amos, Clarissa, and Eric try and get a ship up and running, all while having to deal with local refugees and corrupt security forces that are actively shaking them down for supplies. And it was during these scenes that I felt that old, familiar feeling of tension and excitement, where you're kind of dying to know what's going to happen next, but at the same time, possibly dreading it all at once. Because when this show's firing on all cylinders, the suspense can be pretty exhilarating. So with food and power in short supply, the situation's bordering on desperate. And my favorite bit was when the private security force first swings by and tries to claim as if they're doing the right thing by gathering all the supplies to make sure that they're distributed properly. And Eric, who's a career criminal, he just laughs it off as the most pathetic and transparent shakedown that he's ever seen. And what was beautiful is watching Wes Chatham's performance in this particular scene. Because as the situation starts to get increasingly ugly, he starts to smile because he knows anytime he meets scumbags like this, it's a perfect opportunity for him to break his chain and go into a killing frenzy. And he's enough of a realist to know that this situation is going to get a lot more bloody before it's over. But in the short term, Peaches does try to defuse the situation. But of course, because this is the expanse, naturally all hell eventually breaks loose. And ironically, Peaches gets her hands bloodier than anyone else. The security force comes back in strength and starts taking shots at them with snipers. And while Amos and Eric's forces are trying to make this strategic retreat back to the ship as they rev up its engines, a small part of the security force tries to sneak inside the back way. We don't see the battle, but we see the aftermath of what happens when Peaches turns on her cybernetic enhancements. And she basically just ripped them all limb from limb. And with the last of their allies on board in very satisfying fashion, Eric fries the remaining enemies as he punches the ship out into orbit. And then we get one of these rare, calm, and bittersweet moments where we see Amos looking at the window at the curvature of the planet. And you could probably interpret this scene in a variety of ways, but I got the feeling that he knows that this is the last time that he's going to be departing from the planet of his birth, and that no matter what the future might hold for him, it's not going to be on this planet. But that's all we have prior to next week's season finale. While I know how the book Nemesis Games ends, all the same, I really look forward to seeing the resolution of all these plot lines, in particular Drummer, who appears to be right at her breaking point. Also, one quick note about the season finale. So far, Amazon hasn't provided a press screener for that episode. And assuming they don't send one out between now and then, I'll be watching the episode at its normal time. So unfortunately, my review for the season finale will get posted a couple hours later than I typically like to post them. But it is what it is, as the old expression goes. But if anybody wants to talk about this show or the books between now and next episode, hunt me down on Twitter at Colbrax or leave a comment in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this breakdown and review, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and hitting that notification bell. But I can't thank you enough for watching the video. Greatly appreciate it, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.